<clears throat> we start with a little story here. A woman found herself on the streets, homeless. Not by choice, because who would choose that? But homeless, nonetheless. It's not an easy or pleasant lifestyle, and one does what one needs doing to survive. In her case, as with most women on the street, what she needed was a male protector, which she found in the form of an older man with more experience surviving on the streets. There were trade-offs for his protection, compromises, quid pro quos, and there was always a bottle to self-medicate when she tried to forget her uncomfortable situation. Of course, there were other avenues, such as shelters and government assistance, but it was better to stay with the devil you know than open the bottle and let the government genie out and into your life. So she stayed in her uncomfortable situation, living on the streets in a toxic relationship, unwilling to change. And then one afternoon, napping in the heat of a California summer, on natural under a bridge, a police officer came upon the two of them. Sprawled out on a blanket, empty bottles strewn around them. The officer realized this was a situation that needed to change. Wanting the, to just clothe them and move them along, he announced his presence to wake them up. She woke up and covered herself, tried to wake up her companion from his alcohol-induced grogginess. She was rewarded with three quick slaps across her right, excuse me, left cheek with his right hand. She recoiled in fear and pain. The police officer smiled inwardly, thinking, thank you, I now have a reason to arrest this troll, which he proceeded to do with extreme prejudice, as they say. Oh, memories. <clears throat> Six months later, the officer was on patrol when he saw a professional looking an attractive woman walking down the street and he suddenly, suddenly recognized her as the woman from under the bridge. Stop, what happened? He asked her. Finally, decided enough was enough. It was better to deal with my issues and bureaucracy than stay, com un excuse me, than stay comfortable in that other situation. I now have a job and a home and things are going good. Living with demons is not easy, but sometimes people get comfortable and don't want to do what's required to change. And when they are given the change they need, sometimes they still don't want to accept it. And that's what we're looking at in this passage in Matthew chapter 8, verses 28 through 34. Now there are parallels that I will refer to also in Mark chapter 5, the first 21 verses, and in Luke 8, uh, somewhere else in Luke. Uh, somewhere in Luke 8, but uh, anyway. They help give us the whole picture of this story. But before we get into Matthew, which is what we're going through, let me pray. Father, we do thank you for this day and your love, and indeed the uh, lives changed, Lord, for the better. Uh, especially those lives that are changed by the gospel of Jesus. So help us, Lord, to make changes, to do what's required to be fully devoted, fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. We pray in his name. Amen. All right, Matthew 8, 28 through 34. If you remember, Jesus had been over at Capernaum, healed a bunch of people. They jumped in a boat. There was a big storm. He took a nap, the other guys freaked out, and then uh, he calmed the storm. And they made it to the other side, the east coast of, I guess it would be the west coast for them, but the east side of the Sea of Galilee and the Decapolis. Verse 28, when he came to the other side, to the country of the Gadarenes, and you probably have footnotes where it says, uh, I can't read it because it's too small, but... Gergesenes, Gesserines, different names. Uh, in fact, the town, I don't know if it's the modern day one, but it was also known as Kersey. So in Matthew, though, he called it the Gadarenes, the country of the Gadarenes. Two demon-possessed men met him coming out of the tombs, so fierce that no one could pass that way. 
And behold, they cried out, What have you to do with us, O Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Now a herd of many pigs was feeding at some distance from them. And the demons begged him, saying, If you cast us out, send us away into the herd of pigs. And he said to them, Go. So they came out and went into the pigs. And behold, the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the waters. The herdsmen fled, and going into the city, they told everything, especially what had happened to the demon-possessed men. And behold, all the city came out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they begged him to leave their region. That's what Matthew tells us. This is the word of the Lord. So, <clears throat> what we see here, people in a situation, they need life change, and what... Uh, happens, or a statement to make, is that people want life change, but are unwilling to pay the price for it. Now, you could say sometimes they're unwilling to pay the price for it, but often it's easier to avoid change. And sometimes the situations just grow on you and you don't realize until you're, you know, way deep in it, like the frog and the slowly heating kettle. But people want life change but are unwilling to pay the price for it. That's what was going on in the gatherings and with those people. So we see three things from uh, this story. The first is people will put up with discomfort rather than make changes that will improve their lives. The demoniacs, two of them, in Mark and Luke, there's apparently one that's stronger than the other because it only mentions one demon-possessed man in those two versions of this story, <clears throat> disrupted the daily lives of the nearby residents, right? It says, uh, so fierce that no one could pass that way. Mark and Luke tell us they lived in the tombs, they uh, were ran wild and cutting themselves and howling and making noises and were driven into the wilderness. People tried to restrain them. They used chains to chain them up, but the demoniac was so strong that he broke the chain, chains. And uh, it's obviously like you can't pass that way. You can't restrain these guys. They tried to, but were unable to. They couldn't bury their loved ones because these demoniacs hung out in the tombs probably affected their sleep like a neighbor's barking dog because here they are at night howling and making all kinds of noise. They wanted something done, but they either didn't know what to do or were unwilling to do what had to be done to make the change. So they became comfortable with this evil presence in their midst and ignored it as much as they could until Jesus came along. Now, in Mark and in Luke, it's interesting it does say here, two demon-possessed men met him. But in Mark it says, as soon as Jesus got out of the boat, the demoniac met him. They sensed him coming. They knew he was coming. In fact, you get to see all kinds of great things. Are you here to torment us before the time? They know the end, of what's going to happen to them. And still, they came running to Jesus. I hope we can all admit that there's something in our lives that we have become, un, or excuse me, become comfortable with that we would be better off changing. We make excuses, or we have weaknesses, or we're just lazy. Sometimes it's fear of the change, or we know the cost and we don't want to pay it. Right? The people in the story, they could have called an exorcist. Those things existed. Those people existed at that time. Uh, there's a story in Acts about seven sons of Sceva who try to cast out a demon. And they say, uh, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches. They didn't know Jesus. They just heard about him. They knew that Paul was preaching them. And so they say, hey, in the name of this Jesus that Paul preaches, we want you out. And the demon said, well, I know Jesus, and I know Paul, but who do you guys think you are? In essence, who are you, he says. And then he beat the tar out of those guys and sent them away. Maybe there was a story like that going around, or maybe they didn't know, hey, if we try to do something and get real, we exercise the demons inside of this guy, where's it gonna go? I don't wanna come in at me, you wanna come in at you? Oh, well, better just let it be where it is, where we know it is. 
and let it loose in the community. We'll just work around it. And don't we work around things? I knew four years ago I had hearing loss. Mainly in the frequency of Becky's voice. <laughs> I just thought that was a normal married thing, right? Uh, but no, it's the higher frequencies. It was, you know, that's why I could hear you singing this morning, because I actually got hearing aids. But I got used to saying, what? What? I can't hear you. Or just not answering, even if I knew she was talking, but I couldn't understand what she was saying. So last week, I finally got it checked again, and it had decreased more. So this week, I got hearing aids. And I'll tell you, one of the deciding factors was a study that linked hearing loss with cognitive decline. Um, you know, as you can't interact with the outside world, you withdraw more, and, uh, and that is not always a healthy place to be inside your head, but certainly not inside my head sometimes. Anyway, the discomfort of not hearing well was finally overridden by something, and we decided to make a change. So I was no, way, no longer going to put up with that discomfort, but to fix things. And now I have a new discomfort of hearing all the wonderful little high-pitched frequencies, the, the click-clack of my feet and my dog's claws and the tinkle of silverware and running water. But the good thing is I can control this on my phone and I can actually be listening to the game here while I'm preaching to you on Sunday morning. I'm not, but if you need hearing aids, that's an incentive. You can listen to the game on Sunday rather than me. All right. I have used the phrase, and I stole it from Andy Stanley, uh, or borrowed it. If I give him credit, it's not stealing or borrowing, it's giving him credit. I've used the phrase, time in erodes awareness of, meaning that the longer you're in an environment, the more normalized it becomes. So for the people there, hey, yeah, that's a guy over there, he's crazy, once in a while things break out, but usually it's just uh, whatever, it's normal. <clears throat> There's a stretch of Interstate 5 going through uh, California. 5 goes from Mexico to Canada all the way up through California, Oregon, and Washington. But in the Central Valley of California, south of Sacramento, there's a stretch that's bordered on both sides by dairy farms. Huge. I mean, they look like, you know, fat cow lots, but they're dairy cattle. And uh, it stinks. You can smell it for miles. It's, it, it's worse than anything I've smelled here, so don't be insulted or upset or anything. It's bad. Like, you can't roll your windows down. Heaven help if you're on a motorcycle going down I-5. It just, it hits you, right? And I worked with a girl at another job uh, who grew up on one of those dairy farms. We asked her, hey, you know, how can you stand that? And she said, you get used to it. Like, I can never see myself getting used to that. But the principle is the same for pertinent in every situation in life. People will put up with discomfort rather than make changes that will improve their lives. Now, obviously, you're not going to change a dairy farm. You're not going to get rid of it. Um, and I hope it never happens because I do like milk. Um, that you're going to have to get used to. But there are other things causing discomfort that you can change, but you have to be willing to pay the price. So for now, start by identifying what discomfort are you putting up with? Is it, you know, the discomfort of not being able to interact with people because of hearing loss? Is it uh, neighbors? Anything. What could it be that you are putting up with? List every way that that is negatively affecting your life. This is your to-do, by the way. Identify what you, as discomfort you're putting up with. List the negative ways it's affecting your life. And then here's the good part. You don't have to like solve the problem yourself. I mean, you could start, and I'm sure we're all problem solvers want to do that, but you give it to God. What I mean is spend time in prayer. Look, Lord, and I have had this with personnel, uh, with personal, Look, Lord, here's the thing that is negatively affecting my life. It's interfering with my relationship with you and with others. And here are all the ways it is negatively affecting me. I want to change this, Lord, but I need you to do it or show me the way and give me the strength to do it. Amen. And then here's the challenge, the real challenge. Stop. Look and listen for God's answer. The second thing this story about the demoniacs shows us is there's a cost to change, and radical change like that can cost a great deal. 
And here are some of those, the main bodies of uh, Mark and Luke referenced up there. So what happens is, right, Jesus shows up and, and it says in Mark and Luke that he told the demon come out and that's why it's like, hey, you know, we don't want to, don't throw us into the abyss. Look, there's some pigs over there, send us there. And so Jesus is like, okay, go. I don't know if he knew what was going to happen, but into the pigs they go and, and that particular area does have a steep downslope and they plunge down it, uh, which I've done. Lake Berryessa in Napa was not fun, tumbling down that as a child, child, a teenager. Anyway, uh, into the lake and down and drowned they go. And yeah, it's a pretty safe bet that the locals that were raising 2,000 pigs, because that's what Mark tells us, about 2,000 pigs, they were doing it commercially as pig farmers. And it makes it a safe bet they were not Jews which they probably weren't. It's a more Gentile area. I don't know what the price of hogs was in 33 AD, but another safe bet, it was quite a bit of a loss to see those pigs splash down and drown. And I guess pigs can't swim with their little cloven hooves. <laughs> you think that floating pigs gave someone the idea to fill a pig skin with air and invent the game of football? Lemonade out of lemons, right? When you think about it, this story is great material for a comedy routine, but not to the hog farmers. They no longer had to deal with the demoniac, but they also lost their business and probably didn't have insurance. And even if they did have insurance for it, it wouldn't have been covered. You know why? That's fine. It was an act of God. <laughs> Jesus. God the Son. <clears throat> All right, but seriously, radical change, meaning exorcism of this army of demons, uh, you know, because it says we are called, that's I never missed that part, huh? We're called legion. Uh, doesn't, Matthew didn't tell us that, but uh, Mark or Luke did. And a legion at that time was about almost 7,000 men. We know there was probably at least 2,000 because that's about how many pigs were drowned. But here's this army of demons inside of these men, uh, this man, in this case, it can, you know, radical change can cost a great deal, like a community's industry, but it can cost us individually as well. And, you know, if we count that cost, we may not want to pay it. So, I don't know if you're familiar with, probably you've been around for a few years, Tony Robbins, he's a motivational dude, he helps people achieve desired results in life. And I remember he told a story uh, at an event, he was at an event, he wanted to prove people could make changes. They just had to be willing to do what it takes to make that change in their life. And one attendee, you know, he's like, give me anything and I'll help you change it. One attendee's like, I love chocolate. I'm addicted to chocolate. Can't give up chocolate. I've tried to quit chocolate and I'm just stuck with it. And Tony says, I can help you today. You just got to do what I say. Okay, yeah. He says, all right, here's the deal. You can have all the chocolate you want. Any chocolate you want. But you can't have anything to drink. No milk, no water, no tea, no coffee, nothing to drink. The guy's like, I can do that. I love chocolate. That's great. And he did think it was great until he was a couple Hershey bars into the process. And then if you've eaten chocolate, you know what happens. You want to wash it down with something, right? Nope. You can have your chocolate or you can have a drink. You can't have both. That's the price of radical change. Similarly, in the Bible, the rich young ruler wanted to follow Jesus. He said, Lord, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, well, you know the law. What, you know, you got to uh, obey your parents and not murder and don't steal and these kinds of things. And the guy says, I've done that my whole life. Jesus says, you lack one thing. Sell all your possessions, give your money to the poor, and then come and follow me. <clears throat> The man didn't want to give up his true God, which was his money. That was the cost of the radical change. You want eternal life, you want to follow Jesus, the Messiah, this is what it's going to cost you because that's what you're holding on to. Radical change in life and the cost was too much for him. Toxic friendships, unhealthy enjoyment of food and drink, addictions, hurts, habits, and hang-ups is what they're called in Celebrate Recovery. 
they all cost something to change. Now the cost may be relationships, it may be jobs, it may be money, it may be freedom, but if a change needs to be made, it should be a change for the better, right? Trading a habit for being clean, trading a toxic relationship for healthy ones, trading a life of sin and condemnation for a life of following Jesus and forgiveness and the promise of eternal life. That one's hard for people to make, at least if they count the cost. We talked about that, the, the one guy who uh, wanted to wait for his father to die before he followed Jesus. Right? I want Jesus and my inheritance. Jesus says, no, you got to pick me above all things. That discomfort level has to reach the tipping point that outweighs the cost of radical change. So what for us then? All right, the cost was too much for the Gadarenes. They asked Jesus to leave, as we'll cover in a minute. But it's this radical change. We have this demon disrupting our lives. Now it's gone, but it cost us all of our pigs. Radical change can cost a great deal, but let me ask you this. What's the cost of the status quo? In the long run, what's the cost of not changing whatever it is that needs to be changed? Talked about my hearing, but that's not the only thing that's worsened as I age. I'm easily 20, okay, 30 uh, pounds heavier than I was when I moved here. <clears throat> now, I don't get out and exercise as much uh, like I used to. I can make the excuse about the weather, right? Too hot and humid, oh, too cold and windy. There's ways around that to exercise inside. I can make the, uh, uh, excuse me, so what's the cost about making changes if I put the excuses aside, if I count the cost? Well, you know, being overweight, you can end up with diabetes. Certainly back pain, your back's carrying more weight. Increased workload on my already broken heart. Shortened life and premature death, which is really the same thing as shortened life, just a more harsh way of saying it. I can have long life or I can consume mass quantities, but I can't do both. The average Christian in America would probably say their relationship with God was okay. How's your relationship? Oh, it's okay. Oh, no, I mean, yeah, it's good. It's good. They're saved. That's about it. But to build a relationship, you have to spend time in it, right? And the cost to do that is giving up other things to take up your time. You can have a vibrant and growing relationship with Jesus, or you can spend time doing all the things that distract you from that. In another of Jesus' teachings, he said, you cannot serve two masters. You can't serve God and money. So if you want a relationship with God, you got to give up some other things. Okay, so what if you don't want to pay the cost for radical change and you'd rather stay comfortable? That's what the people of this story chose. Well, there's still a cost for that. And that's point three. Lost opportunity is the cost of rejecting change. So the people lost out, the people of the city of the Gardarines lost out on having Jesus do his ministry there. I mean, if the healed man, because this is what the story tells us in Luke, uh, Jesus gets ready to leave, and the guy's like, please take me with you. You've delivered me. I want to be with you. Take me with you. And Jesus says, no, you stay here and tell your family and everybody what the Lord has done for you. So if he'd gone with Jesus, he would have missed out on this opportunity to share Jesus with the city and the area, the opportunity to be used by God to build the kingdom. The demons, they missed out on going immediately to their forever home in the abyss, but instead they got to experience being pigs. Well, that's a good trade-off. And then they probably wandered around, you know, after the pigs died for 1,930 years and moved to America in the 1960s where they've been living in Hollywood and Washington ever since. <laughs> Rejecting change doesn't just mean out of losing uh, the change but also on all the good that would result in the change. So people experienced a change, the demons were gone, and they wouldn't be bothered by them anymore. The cost was their pigs, which really they could replace eventually. The real sad part is the lost opportunity. If you think about just previously to this, Jesus healed everyone in the region around Capernaum. Healed them of their sickness, their injuries, of their spiritual problems. And now here he was in the Decapolis. They could have experienced the same miracles of healing and freedom from injury, illness, and spiritual oppression, but they missed out on that by rejecting Jesus. What if they hadn't? What if they had welcomed Jesus and asked for whatever he was bringing to be given to them? Please bring us healing. Give us some more and bring some dinner rolls, 
Lord. Could have smoked the pigs and had pulled pork sandwiches for days. Missed out on that opportunity by rejecting Jesus. So rejecting Jesus carries the biggest lost opportunity cost of anything. Not only does a person miss out on the freedom from the burden of sin and the joy of having eternal life, they miss out on living as a citizen in the kingdom of heaven now. So back to my weight loss, not only would I miss out on longer life, but I'd miss out on the extra time that would give me with my family, more importantly with my grandson. And you, dear wife. What would you miss out on in the long run by not making the change you need to make today? So the gatherings, they wanted that change, but they didn't want to pay the price. John Maxwell, many years ago, did a little leadership training on this passage titled, Solve Our Problems, But Save Our Pigs. And that's what it's about. We want change, but we don't want to pay the price. Which do you want? You can't have both. You want pigs, you're going to have problems. You want the problems to be gone, you're going to lose your pigs. There comes a point in life where the discomfort's worse than the cost of making the change that will improve life. And yeah, there's a cost to change and it can be great, but the rewards, particularly since this is a story about Jesus and we're talking about Jesus, and this is church, making the changes that are required to develop and build that relationship with him, the rewards of godly living exceed any cost. So maybe you or those who are watching are stuck in their sin, don't know how to deal with it. Well, you can't on your own. I mean, you need outside help, and that comes from God through Jesus Christ. He paid the price for sin in full on the cross at Calvary. His death and resurrection pay for your sins, so you no longer have to pay for it yourself through death and eternal separation from God in hell. His death and resurrection not only pay for your sin, it wipes you clean, making you spotless and blameless. And Jesus' work pays for your sin, cleans you up, and covers you with his righteousness, so that when God the Father looks at you, he doesn't see a sinner, right? We use that phrase, I'm a sinner saved by grace. Well, sure, because I know who I am, but when I believe in Jesus and follow him and accept him as my Lord and Savior, the Father doesn't see me as a sinner. He sees me as a spotless, blameless, pure reflection of the work done by his son Jesus on the cross. He sees a forgiven son or daughter. The cost of change can be great, but when that change is made for the glory of God, it is totally worth it. Let's pray. Father, thank you. And help us, Lord, to understand and grab hold of these truths today to make changes that are needed. Most importantly, though, Father, I ask that through the Holy Spirit you give us what we need to make these changes. You guide us in these changes. That we rely completely and entirely on you to have our lives changed for your glory. To draw closer to you to experience you more. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, to help you, there are actions on your bulletin inserts, so please take a look at those.